Hi, I'm Libby Halevi, and we're here today with Mary Olson. Now, Mary has given her adult life to helping keep radioactivity from poisoning our living planet. And we are going to talk about that rarest of all things within the nuclear movement, signs of hope. And my friend Libby is here. She's interviewing me, and she is an author, and she is the host of Nuclear Hot Seat a podcast that's been out there for 10 years now and is available at her website, nuclearhotseat.com, along with many resources. Thank you, Libby, for being with me. My pleasure. And I want to remind people that Mary has a website, too, which is genderandradiation.org. Now, Mary, signs of hope, not a usual topic in nuclear matters. Where are we coming from, though? Because we didn't start from a place of hope. What kind of experience of nuclear hopelessness did you have? I'm going to answer that question, but I just have to pop off and say we are living in times of hope. It is, it is a very hard time, but people rising together is what we're going to be talking about throughout this hour. And I just need to acknowledge that that's happening more than I've ever seen it in my entire life. So we are framed by hope. We are uplifted by hope. We are together with hope. So yes, where did it come from though in me to focus on this? And it came from a very early age. I was a kindergartner. I was five years old when I, that was 1963 in the frame of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And our school decided to do a bomb drill and it got very complicated. And in all that, I asked, what's a bomb? I was a kindergartner. My sister and my father told me that it was something that would fall out of the sky and everything would be gone. Mm -hmm. And that night I did my own little logical analysis and decided I'd be better off at home than at this bomb drill thing. And I got very sick. I got strep throat and I was sick enough to stay home and sick enough to drop out of kindergarten and sick enough to be mostly homeschooled for the next 20 years. That's a big change. All uh, because for me in that moment, that day when I was finding out what a bomb was, for me it had already happened. Mm. It had already happened. If we were having a drill, and that's what could happen. And it was all over the news all the time about the nuclear problems and threats and nuclear missiles. It had already happened. How about you, Libby? Where does it go back to for you? Oh, I'm a little bit older than you are. And for me, it was when I was about six or seven years old, Walt Disney had a weekly television program. And one of those programs was called My Friend, Our Friend, The Atom. Got your propaganda right there in the title. And I'd heard about the bomb, but it had no concrete understanding because, again, this was still the mid-50s. And there was an example of explaining what a, um, a chain reaction was. And they used this with ping pong balls on mouse traps in this plexiglass container. And to show what a chain reaction was, they took one ping pong ball and threw it in, and that set off two, and the two set off four. And all of a sudden, they're like going all over the place. And they said, and that's a nuclear reaction, and that's what creates a nuclear bomb. At six years old, what I got from that was that at any moment, an atom could bump into another atom, and we would have this huge explosion, and it would be the end of everything. And I miss the thing about having to have an initiating neutron or whatever it was they explained. So I walked around for years after that thinking that at any moment there could be the equivalent of a nuclear bomb going off right here, right now, in my living room, in my yard, in my school, wherever. And that just reinforced every time I heard anything about the nuclear bomb what was potential and what was possible in the here and now. So it was very immediate for me. Very immediate for you, and what my experience was through those years of homeschooling was that there was no future. Mm. The future, it wasn't that it was a terrible future, it wasn't there. I didn't, I lived on the edge of a cliff. I didn't know how to plan, I didn't know how to do career development, I barely knew how to apply for college. I mean, <laughs> 
truly, I had um, what I now call future blindness because at five years old, the world ended in my mind. I don't know that I would have phrased it that way, but I think my experience was similar because it was an existential, an existential threat that at any moment I would cease to be, but so would everything else. So would everything else. And so generalize that to our generation. We're not going to dwell here, but one can begin to get the idea that maybe the five-year planning cycle, the degree of alcoholism, the amount of drug addiction um, in my generation and yours uh, could be related to these experiences as children. Never so put that one together. It's, it's time to take our heads out of that sand and and pull them up and look around and and see what has gone well because a whole lot has gone well since i was five years old and okay. i've been part of it in a community of people who've worked very very hard well you obviously did not stay in that place of hopelessness as is witnessed by all the work you've done since that time how did you make the decision to work on nuclear issues well first it took a decision to work on anything and for me, that came out about when I was 12 years old and kind of got the idea that I was depressed and that I was bored and that having the idea that the world was already done was boring. And I needed a working hypothesis. And to this day, my working hypothesis is that effort still matters. That taking action, taking one more step, putting in one more ounce of energy still matters. It isn't over. And it isn't over till it's over and it ain't over yet. We're still here. So I love the hashtag still here because it's been my working hypothesis. I'm still here, effort still matters. And uh, so when I had the opportunity to step up on radioactive waste, um, it really fit for me to take that step. And that came as a young adult, I'd had a radiation accident at work. We could talk about that a different day, but basically I became aware that the federal government was going to deregulate massive amounts of radioactive waste. They called it the low regulatory concern, and we're not going to go into it, but they're trying to do it again, and Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NIRS.org, is where to get more information on that. But when I was a woman in my early 30s, I found out they wanted to put radioactive waste everywhere in recycling into consumer products and unlabeled into um, municipal trash. And basically, I stepped up and said, hey, let's stop this thing. And we did. We got Congress to revoke the below regulatory concern policy. It was an unheard of step, but 14 states stepped up and passed state laws to say that deregulation of radioactive waste was inappropriate. And then we got Congress to say deregulation of radioactive waste was inappropriate. This was all in 1991. And we actually got a huge federal policy revoked. And that was the opening moment for me of understanding that when you actually make a difference, when you actually make a change, it is a harbinger of hope. And we're going to step through more of them. Well, that's what I want to talk with you about because you've had 28 years of working with communities on the front lines of fighting against the nuclear fuel chain. What do you see as signs of hope? Indeed, these are community activities and communities working with each other across the country and across the world, indeed. It is not something that one organization or one person, myself, did. It's my own participation and um, being able to show up and say, hey, we can do this, and other people showing up and saying, hey, we can do this. But the things that I'm really proud of is that my aunties and uncles before me um, stopped three quarters of the nuclear reactors that President Nixon forecast. He said there was going to be 1,000 reactors by the year 2000, and there were over 400 on uh, order or under construction when the organization that I worked for for 28 years, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, was founded. And only about 125, including the experimental reactors, came into being. So there was a three-quarters victory before I stepped into the, the game. And another huge victory was the United States deciding to not reprocess the waste from those reactors. 
Your processing is the most deadly, dirty, dangerous, messy, horrific process of taking plutonium, which is produced by every reactor, out of the waste. And again, we're not going to go into all those details, but in 1991, when I began my work, the United States had already decided to stop reprocessing both, well, commercial fuel and soon thereafter military fuel as well. Huge victories, huge, huge victories. And then the next one we did was to stop the targeting of na native lands. In 1991, the federal government thought that Native American reservations were the perfect place for highly radioactive waste to be stored and or disposed. Hmm. And this was sold as being, they were uniquely qualified because they care about our planet, unlike the dominant society that's making this waste. And they care about the seventh generation. And so they would be great stewards. And I had the great honor of joining with Grace Thorpe, who was a Sac and Fox elder. And she brought in my friend Chuck Johnson. And we also worked with my friend Lance Hughes of Native Americans for Clean Environment. And we got that entire program defunded. And Grace went around with her NICONA, which was the National Environmental Coalition of Native Americans, and met with the tribes that had accepted Department of Energy money to see if maybe they had a storage site on their lands with sort of bribe money. And they all sent it back including one very big check got sent back. So there were only two out of 27 proposals that we ended up having to go you know, into the weeds on, but they haven't happened either. The Mescalero Apaches never accepted waste, and the Skull Valley Go Shoots also have never had radioactive nuclear waste go to their lands. So 100% uh, stoppage of that, except for the Shoshone lands in Nevada. And I am so proud that for over 30 years, the Shoshone people and the Nevadans together have stopped nuclear waste going to Yucca Mountain, which is a seismically active site with a volcano below it. Thank you very much. A magma pocket, all the signs and symptoms of a potential eruption through the nuclear waste repository. Who thought that would be a good idea? They didn't think. And it ain't an idea. It was a default position, and they were just trying to get rid of this stuff to someplace that they could pawn it off in a very, very uh, demeaning, prejudiced, you know, give it to the Indians, give it to people who don't speak English, give it to people who deserve other types of economic development. And uh, this was Congress doing this decision, and we have stopped it. A huge number of people in that we across the entire United States. Everybody who found out that you can't take nuclear waste from point A to point B without moving it on a truck or a train or a barge. All of those people, the Shoshone people, the Nevadans, many members of Congress from across the United States, many organizations, over 200 at our peak, were united in saying no to Yucca Mountain. And we have stopped waste going there every year for 30 years. Mm. And I take that, even though we're not totally done, it's not totally off the books, huge, huge signs of hope that we together have the ability to impact those decisions and be holding the place for better decisions. Um, I'm going to keep going. I'm on a roll. You okay with this? <laughs> well, Can I keep going? There's absolute, more. Absolutely, more. because you've got the information, and especially about the treaty. Ah, the Treaty of Ruby Valley. We would not have a United States of America, but for Lincoln being able to get the money from the Comstock load of gold in California to pay the troops that he owed money to. The gold was escorted by Shoshone people through their New Zagobia lands with protection to get it to Lincoln under a treaty that was struck, that struck at that time called the Treaty of Ruby Valley. Mm -hmm. And that treaty is being directly violated in terms of thinking about exporting the worst waste this society has ever made, at least right up there with any other worst waste, to New Zagobia, to the Western Shoshone, to Yucca Mountain. And the Shoshone people are standing firm and strong saying, we do not approve this idea and you will be breaking our treaty if 
you proceed with this program. So they do not give consent. Well, the treaty that I was making reference to, I didn't know about that one, uh, is the one on the prohibition of nuclear weapons as being another sign of hope in the world. Yes, indeed. And, and I will jump there after mentioning that we stop 30 more reactors, we stop putting plutonium fuel in reactors, and we have a new treaty, which is 10 nations away from being ratified and coming into force. This is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I was invited in 2014 to speak as uh, an expert on the humanitarian consequences. You know, as an American, I thought for years, there are no humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. I didn't understand that they were referring to humanitarian law which is one of the biggest sources of hope right now, is that people in this planet together are saying that humanitarian law has jurisdiction over the question of whether we end the world or end survivability or end a, a nation state. It isn't only a military question, it is a humanitarian law question. And so this new treaty, like the landmine prohibition, is under the United Nations General Assembly and not under the Security Council and it affirms the right of any nation to declare itself nuclear free with the force of law behind it and invites every nation on the planet to become nuclear free and when the 50th nation signs and the treaty comes into force nuclear weapons will be in the same kind of category as biological weapons and chemical weapons. They will be illegal on this planet under this treaty. And the biggest sign of hope for me is that people got together and have been figuring out how to have an agreement that isn't about rolling into another country and saying, we're going to take your weapons away. It is instead a great step forward providing mechanisms for any nation that's ready to undertake them mm. to get rid of them we mean we made them we made them as my mother used to say you can't go out and play until you clean up your room and we've got to clean up the nukes and all of the radioactivity and the waste and everything else that has been left behind by it what I want to do now is just shift to some of what your work is these days, which is so important, that radiation has a disproportionate impact to women and especially little girls. Talk to us about that. This is evidence that is in the largest uh, tracked population of exposed people, which very tragically are the survivors of the A-bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the lifespan study that emerges from that horrific act that my government, our government, took to destroy cities full of people and then track them for now 60 years. Um, the evidence from that group is unequivocal that um, radiation has a gendered factor, that biological sex makes a difference, that the adult male that is currently used to set all radiation standards is in fact the most resistant part of the human life cycle to radiation harm. Little boys, the unadult male, are more harmed. But here's the big one. Comparing female bodies who are little girls to male bodies who are little boys, all exposed at the same time and then setting a fixed dose, you get twice as much cancer as an outcome across 60 years from exposing little girls compared to exposing little boys. Twice, that's enormous. And then you compare the outcome for those little girls to the adult male who is used to set the standards, and you find out that the global radiation regulatory group of people are underestimating radiation impact by as much as a factor of 10 because of the difference in outcomes for females exposed as children. And we are all, who are female, exposed as children. Naturally occurring radiation, now we fly in airplanes, now we go to the dentist, now we go to the doctor, 
different amounts, yes, but cumulatively over our lives, um, exposures are getting higher and higher and higher. And those cumulative impacts are what we're talking about. And so we're not talking about increased childhood cancer, we're talking about total cancer in females compared to total cancer in males. And that begins to be a very, very large number at the industrial population levels. So it's time. It's time to validate these findings. It's time to start asking the question, why is there a difference? And it's time to start providing a basis for regulatory change. Because right now, we have regulations written for that one guy who was the military guy during the Manhattan Project, the military guy working on making nuclear weapons the commercial reactor guy at work. But we have a whole life cycle, and we have to protect the whole life cycle. And in the life cycle, we know little girls are harmed more than, and are not being protected. So that's my biggest sign of hope, is we now understand that there's an evidence base for protecting everybody better. What's wrong with that? You also have a unique suggestion for figuring out radiation risks and protective measures, and it has to do with changing the model. Tell us about that, briefly. Yes, we have a model called Reference Man. He's a particular height, weight, lifestyle. He's white, he has a European or North American industrial lifestyle. All of those are defined. We need to say thank you, Reference Man, give him a gold watch and retire him, and create Reference Little Girl. Yeah. Because if we use Reference Little Girl, everybody will be better protected. And it's only a first step. We don't know anything about the reproductive impacts across the whole population. Nobody's been looking, hello. So Reference Little Girl is a first step and she is a sign of hope. Mary, your work is so important and there is a website. Tell people where they can find more information on gender and radiation impacts. So the name is Gender and Radiation Impact Project or GRIP. And the website is genderandradiation.org. And it's spelled out A-N-D. It's not an ampersand. Correct. Genderandradiation.org. Right. Mary, we could talk for hours about this, and I look forward to doing so on Nuclear Hot Seat. For now, thank you so much for lending your expertise and all your years of work and knowledge to this day's important programming. Thank you, Libby, for sitting with me. And I want to end on this note that we all have dark days still. However, everybody who is participating and everybody watching right now, I want you to know you are my hope. Thank you. Thank you.